This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, chiropractor Dr. Lauren Dodds explains how cellular hydration works and why it's so important both to the structural integrity of the body as well as our mental and emotional states. Dr. Dodd's unique perspective comes from her work practicing upper cervical chiropractic care, cranial sacral therapy, the Arvigo techniques of myoabdominal therapy, and incorporates her deep understanding of quantum health as a graduate of Applied Quantum Biology Levels 1 and 2. This episode is a really good overview of how our bodies work at the quantum level. I definitely recommend listening to this one more than one time. Enjoy. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to an episode of the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Lauren Dodds. I'm very excited to speak to you. Um, so, Lauren, you are a chiropractor and a cranial sacral therapist. And are there other modalities I'm missing out? I seem to remember you do a lot of different things. Yeah, I also had the training for Arvigo therapy, which is an uh, abdominal Mayan massage. So a lot of different body work techniques that I've added to my repertoire, especially as I learn how cool fascia is and how supportive maintaining good alignment and structure really is for our body, even on a quantum scale. <laughs> cool. Okay. So let's get into that because you have um, studied very deeply in, in quantum biology, working with Carrie and Heather and all of the faculty. So tell us what led you to want to study quantum biology as somebody who works mainly with physical touch and the structure of the body? Yeah, so I have two kiddos. And after the birth of my daughter, my second child, I just was still so tired. And preconception prep is like my jam. It's a, a strong passion point for me. And I did all of this work before her birth. So I was very confused as to why it was still so depleted postpartum to the point where like my husband would get up early and get them breakfast and I would stay in bed and then he would go to work and I would be like, come snuggle me. So I wouldn't have to get up. And it was great time, but I, it was really hard for me to wake up in the morning and just have energy throughout the day. And I, have done additional like functional medicine training, was doing all those things, like trying different detoxes. And I was just still, you know, kind of clueless as to why I still had no energy. And just a little bit about me and my background is I got into upper cervical chiropractic because I had multiple concussions that uh, progressed into post-concussive syndrome. So basically a headache that didn't go away for over a decade. And it was the upper cervical care that really got me out of that. And I feel like was the strongest foundation for my healing from that. But I did not realize the depth of my mitochondrial dysfunction from that, I think, in particularly. And so seeing Carrie's posts and Dr. Cruz's posts on Instagram um, really helped me understand the depths of knowledge that you can go in this quantum field, because I knew about morning light and I, I had blue light blockers, but I really feel like I didn't truly understand the science to the level that motivated me to make enough changes. And I feel like I also didn't realize how dysfunctional my mitochondria were just because of my personal history. Um, Cause I think it was Nate, Nathan that said on that first lesson was like, some people are so damage that they not only need to block their eyes, but their skin too, because those options are all over our skin as well. So I feel like when I saw Carrie's posts and I was able to take the level one, I really understood the level of dysfunction that my body was dealing with. And as I made those changes, it was, I was like, I can't be this simple, but it is. It was just so amazing right. how much energy I had. And now I'm doing so much and not even, you know, not even having to consider it. And I'm getting up for sunrise really easily. Like today, I just woke up, like there's no alarm or anything. And a year ago, if I could have just slept, it would have been 9 30, 10, 10 30. And I would still have woken up feeling tired, feeling achy, feeling 
um, super congested and just inflamed. Like my face would always be puffy. And like I said, I was trying so many things, all my things that I knew from a structure standpoint, from a biochemistry standpoint were helpful. But as soon as I started really implementing the biophysics, that's when the energy and the light bulbs really turned on for me as far as my capacity. And for my husband too. I mean, (laughs) he's my best guinea pig when I'm learning all this (laughs) stuff. Oh, he's amazing. So he just, you know, similarly had some experiences as a teenager and he can't believe his processing level, like his concentration level. And yeah, the ease that he gets to go through his day now. And I feel like when you clear that fog, just physically clear that fog mentally, it opens up so much more joy for your life. Like I, like I would hate doing dishes or hate thinking about dinner. And now because I feel better, it's like, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? Like there's so much room for joy, so much room for happiness because I don't have this load that was there. And so that's, that's kind of my path to biophysics and quantum biology. And, And I feel like every time there's a new lecture or a new book or a new podcast, I just get more and more excited about how everything intertwines. That's it's so, so cool. cool. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, and that's such a good point about the joy. I noticed that as well. There were there were so many tasks that I just couldn't handle in my life, or I just felt so overwhelming or so depressing. And yeah, it's having the energy to do them. And then once you have that energy, it's like, oh, this is this is okay. This is fun. Yeah, this is nice. I'm doing this for my family. Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. And just a note for the audience, um, quantum biology and biophysics are the same thing. It's just different parts of the words coming together in different ways. <laughs> so, uh, Lauren, I want to I want to jump back to something that you said um, where you made the connection that your accident had had harmed your mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Could you say a little bit more about what you learned about how how a physical trauma could have an effect on our mitochondria. Yeah, I think a uh, traumatic brain injury in general is is structurally harmful to the brain and our brain is one of our most mitochondrial dense tissues. That's why mitochondrial dysfunction shows up as a, you know, chronic fatigue or brain fog um, a lot of times. So that physical trauma and I had multiple multiple hits. I feel like Unfortunately, sometimes when you have one concussion, your head becomes a magnet um, for more, for whatever reason, maybe from a loss of perception and visual field um, capacity. But um, that physical trauma to my brain creates a disruption in the function of the mitochondria, particularly because the brain is such a mitochondrial dense tissue organ. So there's a lot of journal articles that I went down on of making that connection between brain trauma and then causing that mitochondrial dysfunction. And so actually I made a little bit more on that. I was just reading an article um, on mitochondrial dynamics and this whole fission and fusion and the fusion of mitochondria coming together to make these super clusters to actually span the length of the cell. And they do that based on the microtubules And microtubules in the cell respond to external stressors. So like pressure, shearing, this mechanotransduction where there's a mechanical force and that creates a signal to make a change somewhere in the body. So the mitochondria, the micro that they line up on those microtubules responds to external stressors. So an X, whether that's positive or negative, right? So uh, this brain trauma potentially has the chance to affect that microtubule microtubule structure within the cell and maybe impact the biodynamics of the mitochondria so they can't fuse together and form these, you know, better, more efficient clusters. So interesting. So what what would the symptoms be that would show up as a result of that not happening? Um, so all the signs of mitochondrial dysfunction, um, brain fog, fatigue, 
dehydration. Um, and there's so many things that go with that, right? Dehydration. So like uh, high blood pressure, like poor lymph drainage, poor detoxification systems, um, poor mucous membranes, poor GI function. So that's what blew my mind about the biophysics is how important hydrated body is. And I think that's what really is making me a better practitioner because I had the fascial structure side, but I didn't realize the key to the water in the structure, like fascia and water go together. If one is dysfunctional, then the structure is not going to work. It's called structured water for a reason. (laughs) Absolutely. So for our listeners who are a little newer to this, when we talk about being dehydrated, um, in a biophysics sense or quantum biologic sense, we're not just talking about like, we didn't have enough water to drink. Yes. We're talking about it in a whole other way. Could you explain a little bit about? Yes. And this was hydration. Yes. This was a huge light bulb for me because I drank a ton of water and never felt that I ever got unthirsty. And I knew, like, I know, know my training, like headaches, dehydration, you know, get rid of the dehydration, get rid of the headaches. And it never clicked how it said in my textbooks, right? And so the water that we drink is called bulk water. And one thing about it is that it has, even from a pure glacial melts or spring water, it has higher levels of deuterium and it makes it heavier. And it's harder for our body to process that. And it's also doesn't have the same structure that the water that our mitochondria makes. So two things is, I know Carrie loves about the electron transport chain is yes, it makes ATP, but at the end of it, your mitochondria makes this amazing water, which is completely depleted of deuterium. So it's really light, it's more efficient, and it has the capacity to structure itself along these biological surfaces like fascia into these cool hexagonal structures where there's a positively charged uh, wire with that negatively charged exclusion zone water. So not only does it have an amazing structure internally within itself, but then it creates this cool structure in the form of a battery along our fascia or any biological surface. So it's not just drinking water, it's making sure that your mitochondria can generate that um, structured water, that exclusion zone water, that is really what is hydrating you. And yes, you need some bulk water. You need to drink water to be able to do that. But you ultimately, what was most important, especially on my journey, is the ability for my mitochondria to make that water. I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Think- so, so the the bulk water, what you're calling bulk water, is what most of us think of when we think of water um we go to the store we get some spring water or we turn on the tap that's all bulk water but then there's a different kind of water which is structured water fourth phase of water that our our mitochondria make when they are healthy and that's the that's the root cause of hydration yes (laughs) yes if you don't have that happening that's where you are feeling dehydrated or you are dehydrated because you can drink a lot of water and not really turn it into that structured water that's really hydrating and running all of our bodily processes. Right. So there's a so having hydrated mitochondria affects sort of every aspect of health possible. But since I'm talking to you, let's focus on the fascia. Um, so when our our mitochondria are make is making the structured water or the easy water, um, our bodies are hydrated at a cellular level. Mm-hmm. So when we have properly hydrated bodies, okay, so first of all, before we go into the benefits of that, could you just give a quick overview of what to do to have, to enable, to have healthy mitochondria, just sort of like a little 101. Sure. In terms of in terms of habits, and then we'll go into what the effects of those habits will be. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things is getting infrared light. Um, that infrared light 
helps to grow the exclusion zone water. So physically grows the bonds. Um, also that sunlight helps, that's the fusion and fission of the mitochondria. So making more um, these kind of cool super clusters of mitochondria is also directed by our, our circadian rhythm. So having a good circadian rhythm where you're going outside you see sunrise light, that infrared light, your brain tells you to switch to the pituitary gland, you're running your endocrine system properly, and then you go throughout your day, you get the UV light, and then you kind of come down to the other side of the infrared light at sunset, then that's setting your endocrine system to your pineal gland so that you can really run your repair processes at night. So having the uh, capacity to switch back and forth by seeing these different phases of sunlight and understanding how they direct your entire uh, physical body is going to help you to switch to those two sides of your endocrine systems. And, you know, a lot of times we're like, go, 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 go. But I think a lot of us don't give ourselves the capacity to rest. And a big piece of that is seeing that sunset and telling our body that it's time to switch into repair mode. And another big piece of that is our blocking the blue light at night because melatonin is really what is being released from that pineal gland um, to run those repair processes, not just for like our, like if we have tissue damage, but mitochondrial damage as well. And so when you are exposed to blue light or green light post sunset, that is going to affect melatonin release. So you're not going to release as much melatonin. So that's why blocking blue light at night is so important. Um, not only the eyes, but potentially the skin as well. Uh, it's just interesting because through our experiments, like at first it was just like, okay, we just stick the blue lights, but we've since gone to red and amber lighting at night. And it's amazing how much of a difference it is. Like the skin receptors really do matter. So making sure that you're getting good sunlight during the day, and then making sure that you're blocking the artificial light at night, I think are two of the biggest things that you can do for your mitochondrial health. Um, getting good quality water is huge. So the bulk water that you drink, you want to make sure the big ones are fluoride and chlorine. Um, fluoride really damages the exclusion zone water. So making sure that you have some kind of filter that removes those toxicities. Um, the cool thing about structured water is because I used to be really like, ah, I got to get rid of all the toxins. But if you have good structured water, it will actually structure around toxins and help you detox those. So the focus... Um, of mitochondrial function with these different circadian biology supports kind of helps you manage some of these other things. So you don't have to add this other stress load to your, to your you know, workings of trying to be as healthy as you can. So, but I do think that chlorine and fluoride are really ones that you want to be considerate of. Um, I think the other big thing is adding minerals. So if you're don't have the capacity to forage for fresh mineral spring water, um, making sure you're adding minerals in, uh, whether that's some kind of electrolyte or if you're getting herbal teas, um, lemon, lime juice, fresh squeezed in your water. So something to add because that helps the water structure. Um, I remember Dr. Stillman saying that he felt that the mineral content that you had in your body really affects the quality of the structure. And I know Carrie talks about that, you know, there's different qualities of structure. And I think you can optimize that by really having those minerals or those colloids available to you. So I feel like those are my big three. And then I think good structure. So um, uh, having the capacity to move and move well is going to create free electrons in, in the body. So I guess that's the other big thing, increasing your redox potential. So movement does that, um, but so does grounding and making sure that you're getting bare feet because the 
I loved the saying that the body doesn't run on carbs, proteins, fats, it runs on electrons. And so yes, it converts those foods into electrons, but there's also so many different ways that you can gather electrons. And the easiest is just going outside and putting your, your bare feet um, in the earth, but also taking care of your structure so that you can move well is going to create that piezoelectric effect so that you can generate free electrons yourself with your movement. So I feel like those are the big things. Your your light environment um, during the day and at night, um, your water, uh, your mineral content, and the grounding, gathering electrons, I feel like are all the big four for me as far as supporting good mitochondrial function. And you can get into more nitty gritty, but honestly, I've just learned that it can be simple. Let, let it be simple. Yes. <laughs> yes. And thank you for that. That's a really nice comprehensive overview that explains why, but doesn't go too deep. So that was, that was wonderful. And I really think that you um, explained really well, the, like the magic of quantum biology or biophysics, which I think once practitioners make this connection, it's, it's like, the world changes, right? And it's like, yes. the light is <laughs> hydrating us, right? Like yes. our light environment is dictating whether our cells are hydrated or not. And hydrated cells are dictating almost everything else. And like, just that simple understanding is so profound to how we live and how we, you know, how the practitioners treat their clients and their patients. So thank you for that. Okay. So we do, um, if we're doing the, what, you know, living how you described, we've just mm -hmm. sort of boosted our health in a very meaningful way in sort of every capacity. But let's focus in on the fascia, which is your, which is your area. So mm -hmm. talk to me about the benefits of healthy fascia. Yeah. So fascia is so cool. I mean, in the, and it's only a recently looked at tissue in the body before when they would do dissections, they would just cut it away and be like, this is junk tissue. This is not what we need to be looking at. Right. And I think now that they're pulling back and realizing this is maybe all we need to be looking at. I mean, I won't <laughs> go that far, but it literally surrounds every single structure in the body. So every bone, muscle, every individual muscle fiber, every individual cell. And when you like when you start to really look at it, you're just like, this stuff is literally everywhere. And it's supportive. And I think you know, going back to this whole idea that uh, Gilbert Lang said is that we don't have enough ATP to work how we've been told it works, right? And I think that goes with our structure and our tone of our body as well. I think it's the fascia. The fascia is everywhere. And there's there's certain points that, that in cranial sacral and osteopathy, they talk about diaphragms where the fascia runs more um, horizontally. Um, in kind of concentrated areas. And so if we have this combination of a properly coordinated diaphragm of fascia and this good structured water around it, we are gonna have an inherent tone in maintaining the structure of the body where we're not gonna have to waste ATP on to maintain a certain level of structure. So that combination, I feel so, like is sorry, so... Sorry, when you say like maintain a certain level of structure, what do you mean by that? So we have a certain tone to our muscles, right? Like if you have seen a baby that doesn't have good tone or is low tone, they call them floppy baby syndrome. And they're just like, they can't do anything. And so that would take a lot of energy to move through the world like that. And so if you have coordinated fascia in these diaphragms and you have quality structured water, properly hydrated, you know, hydrating that fascia, you're not going to have this floppy baby. You're just going to have an inherent tone that you're going to be able to maintain your structure through space with a level of ease that you would not be able to if you have discoordinated or dysfunctional fascia and you are dehydrated. It just takes so much more energy to move through the world like that. And that's With another the structure of the body, how we're able to move our posture, how our muscle tone, like all of those things. Yes. Yeah. So 
there's fascia everywhere, but then it's also coordinated in these diaphragms, which I really help think help support the tone of the body. And then we get into the dynamic movements. You know, our body was designed to be in motion. And every time you move and every time that fascia helps coordinate a muscle contraction or an action, it's going to send messages to the brain. And those are going to be more positive, calming messages if that movement is fluid. Um, and then your brain's going to be able to send messages back to the body being like, hey, we are at ease. We are safe, right? The, the number one thing that the body wants to know is, is it safe? And so if you are moving fluidly with coordinated fascia and hydrated structured water supporting that movement, it's going to send messages to your brain that you are safe. And then your brain's going to be able to tell the rest of your body that you are safe. If you have a dysfunctional movement and it's really hard to like reach out because you are dehydrated or you have discoordinated fascia, then it's going to send danger messages to your brain that you are not as safe. And then your brain's going to tell your body and things are going to respond um, as such. Because there's this whole idea that like, you know, we look at the body as vitalistic or mechanistic, right? And a lot of times we're treated as patients that our body is a machine and a different part is broken. But our body is so intelligent and what it's doing is responding to the environment, both externally and internally that we're supporting it in. And so it's not breaking down. It's not dysfunctional. It's doing what it needs to do in the environment that you're putting it in. And fascia and structured water are are a huge part of that. (laughs) Wow. This is amazing. It's so amazing to me how often the concept of safety signals comes up. Um, I I just did a podcast with um, Dr. Kelly Ritter, who has a counseling background, and she was talking how the she was saying how the vagus nerve, it turns out, is made of fascia. <laughs> yes. Well, that's like literally everything. And that's so like, yes, you have you have nerve impulses, but you also have all this fascia along it that's sending electrons through it. You know, like because the main component, a main component of fascia is collagen and collagen forms those triple helix that create these micro nanotubules of water that send water because of its size, ridiculously fast. So yes, you have a nerve impulse that's going through that nerve, but then you have these super highways of electrons that are also sending energy and information. So yes, it's the nerve, but it's also the fascia surrounding the nerve that's also supporting that nerve impulse. And I think on the, uh, Dr. Cruz and Dr. Uberman were talking about this, how the brain, like, yes, there's nerve impulses, but there's this whole quantum mechanics of, the brain and neuron communication that no one's really talking about. Yes. Dr. Uberman called it inconvenient, but yes. you can the see the anomalies that just keep yeah. piling up that don't yes. fit the current paradigm. And now the, the pile of anomalies is so high. <laughs> We're like, yes. we need another paradigm. And that's where quantum biology, biophysics explains that, yes, that that quantum superhighway, those messages are happening at the quantum level, not just yeah. at a mechanism. A mechanistic one. yeah that was beautifully explained okay keep going. so we're so we're so complex that I think we need both right but I think that yeah. the thing that's missing is this foundational biophysics I think that's the foundation like how much electrons do we have and then you know because if you look at um single-celled organisms a, a big stimulus of theirs they don't have a nervous system they're responding to the sun And so then we become progressively more complex where we've added a nervous system and an endocrine system on top. But we've gotten so much into the nitty gritty of those that we've forgotten this foundational biophysical level. And it needs to be first. (laughs) Number one needs to be increased redox potential. And then maybe we can, you know, start to do some of these nitty gritty things if that's not clearing out all the symptomatology. Right. Yes, and that's that's a great point to bring up is the the idea, you know, I like to talk in metaphors. I'm not a I'm not I'm not a scientist. I'm a, more of a researcher and a behavior change support coach. So I like to talk in metaphors. And what really made a difference to me was this understanding of like the mitochondria are like little 
receptors. They're like little environmental sensors and our body is filled with them and they're continuously on a quantum level, sensing everything in every frequency that's in our environment and responding to that. And so when the frequency is something that it doesn't know what to do with, like, like most man-made light or most man-made frequencies, they freak out and break down. That's the like <laughs> non-scientific <laughs> metaphorical way to explain all this if someone's listening. Yeah. Did that. Yeah, I think another way that I really like to look at it too, Meredith, is stagnation, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've taught, I was told this analogy in chiropractic school that if you look at a pond of stagnant water, like how much, how dirty is that water? And if you have properly, if you have good movement in good water, that's, you know, they say that's antibacterial. I mean, that's healing. Like I had a cut. We went to the ocean, the beach yesterday and had a cut and it's like a couple hours in moving water and it's like almost all the way healed. Whereas the first two days, it like looked kind of gross for a cut, you know, like a little cut. So it's just amazing when we have good frequencies, good movement, good water and a good path to like do that along how healing our, how self-healing our body has been designed to be. Wow, that's true. So when everything's flowing the way that it's supposed to, as you were mentioning earlier, that structured water can clear out a lot of toxins. Whereas if you're dehydrated and stagnated, exposure to mold or chloride or anything like that is going to have a much more serious impact on your health. Yes. And I think that's where my practice has shifted. Like before, when I was doing the functional medicine and biochemistry like my additional support was like, let's kill, 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 detox, detox, detox. And now it's like, okay, what can I do to help, like you said, support these sensors so that they are sensing and then self-healing properly, like that they get the signal, but then how can we switch it into a capacity to self-heal better? So how can we help the body not be a good host for parasites? How can we help the body clear mold or clear excess fluid? How can we, you know, just help those repair processes so there's not stagnation and damaged tissue that's just hanging out because the body can't handle it. And I think when you make that shift, there's so much more ease with that because, you know, these detox protocols can be really intense and not feel good, especially if you have a low redox potential. Um, that's what happened to me. And so making that subtle shift in perception, right? I love those, like, this is this paradigm, but hey, look at this paradigm over here. And that they're really subtle shifts, but they can make all the difference. And I know you see that with your coaching of people, just, you know, small shifts in perceptions can change people's lives. Absolutely. That's beautifully put. And yes, I love, I think my, my favorite Dr. Cruz quote is redox before detox. Yeah. <laughs> like give our bodies a little something to work with before we put them through that. Yeah. Absolutely. You, so you need the energy. Come, yeah. Yeah. You need the energy for the detox to work and the structured water and all of it. Uh, and then it, it's a much more gentle process. Okay. So. I want to just come back to um, something that you mentioned earlier, because you submitted some really beautiful work um, during the certification on the power of touch. Mm -hmm. And I was really, while you were talking about how having healthy um, fascia and healthy movement sends safety signals to the brain, like, oh, that's why massage is so relaxing or so calming. Uh, One of the reasons, I'm sure there's more. Could yeah, you go in a little bit into sort of what's going on from a quantum biologic point of view with physical touch. Yeah. So a couple of things we kind of I kind of mentioned this. I think this whole mechanotransduction, like a shearing or pressure, can have positive effects on the extracellular matrix that they've seen that the extracellular matrix goes through the cell membrane through these integrin proteins. And then that goes to the cytosol, the cytoskeleton, and then all the way into the, across the nuclear membrane into the nucleus to literally change 
DNA um, expression. So just the act of like putting pressure on the body can have that whole cascade of effect. Um, in addition, what I've noticed, especially with kids, I feel like because they're more in tune with their bodies, maybe a little bit is an infrared heating. So especially when I'm doing the cranial sacral work, when I have my hands on someone, it's creating infrared heat. And they'll say, oh my gosh, it's getting so hot. <laughs> and we've talked about how infrared heat, infrared light. So yes, it's heat, but it's also light. And that was a big click for me that I literally have light coming out of my hands. I'm making this light. And so just if you are a practitioner, doing all of these things makes you a better practitioner. So I'm literally creating light and warming and increasing that exclusion zone water by putting my hands on someone. Um, also, electrons flow from high density to low density. So I'm giving them electrons, especially if I have a high redox potential. So I'm giving them light as well as energy and information to do what they need to do to heal. And then the other thing that I've really come to realize is the intention and how important that is. And the idea that when you, um, like Emoto's work with sending different frequencies to water and an intention is a frequency that you can literally change the structure to a more positive structure versus a more negative. So if I stay in tune with what I am trying to do, I can affect the structure of their water as well. And I think by affecting the water, you are affecting the structure, not only of the fascia, but also of the water. And it's really those two together that I'm realizing that make up the true structure of the body. So those are the big things on the quantum scale that I'm doing with my physical touch. Okay, could you just say that one more time, the two things together, those two things being? Um, the structured water and the fascia. Because so when fascia, when you have lack of movement, um, disordered movement or trauma, then the fascia is going to create adhesions. And it's like these disorganized clumps of fascia. And so I feel like the water can't structure on that as well. And so you have a dysfunction of the fascia and the dysfunction of the water. So the whole structure is impacted. And so that also explains why the idea of fitness and movement is so foundational to our concept of health, which it yeah. is, right? If we're not yeah. going to move that out of the way. However, to have an intense fitness practice without taking our biophysical nature into account. Yeah. So we're still going to run into problems. Yeah. That's why it's hard for me sometimes when people are in need of support and they're running. Like, I feel like there's a fine balance there because we need to, we want to do movement that's supportive and not going to keep damaging and putting us back. Cause there's a fine, there really is a fine line there. And I think that once you're aware of how important the structure of your body is, there are certain modalities that can help you get that back. Not, you know, Body, passive body work like chiropractic, osteopathy, cranial sacral therapy, but also more active modalities like functional movement um, trainers, like a functional patterns trainers. So once you understand how important that structure is, part of your exercise and movement, I think, should be retraining the structure so that you have good structure to move through. Because if you're moving through an altered structure, there is some benefits, right? There's a piezoelectric effect. Um, it can be hydrating, but it also can be dehydrating and you need to find the right balance there. And I think that comes with having the awareness of what your structure is and then always trying to do a little bit better. Like no one's going to be perfect, but I think if we have that intention of trying to be better, that also is going to be positive for our body. Absolutely. So cool. So when we have those aches and pains and we go to a chiropractor, um, we're really going to enhance what that 
practitioner is able to help us with if we're also going outside in the morning and drinking good water and blocking the light. Those yes. All work together. Yes, I think that's what's been so amazing for my practice is the home care recommendations that I can give to my patients to help facilitate a higher healing capacity. Um, like when you have soft tissue damage, the mitochondria is what is directing whether that cell regenerates into normal tissue or uh, repairs into more fibrotic like scar tissue. So if you have poor mitochondrial function, it's not going to be able to just uh, regenerate. It's going to create more scar tissue, which creates more dehydration and fascial disruptions and your structure is going to be impaired. So that's what I think is so cool about knowing this stuff is I can tell my patients how to support their mitochondria and their biophysics so that they're going to be healing at a capacity even greater. Like before I knew all this, <laughs> I had a little baby. I was making, doing a lot of cranial work and making good change fascially. And he was, you know, getting better somewhat. Um, but he was kind of on the fail, failure to thrive spectrum. And I, you know, a lot of times if people come to chiropractors as a last resort, but all I said was, okay, let's try and get him out in sunlight in the morning. And I didn't even know this was, you know, multiple years ago, like two or three years ago. And it was a different baby. Like it was a weekend, a different baby came back into my practice. And because, wow. you know, as a practitioner, you're doing all these things and you're like, okay, I see structurally that things are changing, that things are better. What is missing? Like, why do the symptoms not match up? And I think the difference is, is the the mitochondrial status of a patient. And that's what's going to really help them respond better to the care that you're providing. Um, personally, I've had with my injuries, I've had so many tight muscles that I have tried lots of different modalities. And when, again, when I became more hydrated, my body started responding more to, um, you know, trigger point work or ball rolling or myofascial release. Like there's just a, uh, that hydration status just opens up a capacity to change, you know, because there's new energy and information for you to take and heal. So I think that the two, having this knowledge has just been a game changer for supporting patients in increasing their healing capacity. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that, that little baby. Yeah, and we've been, you know, especially as mamas, we've been told to keep our children out of the sun. And, uh, not, not great advice, it turns out, especially yeah. that morning light where you can't even get a sunburn. Yeah. And that's like, if you're struggling, like as a practitioner, like I, it has been really easy to say, okay, you need to get out during this time where there's infrared light, because guess what? There's no UV light. You can't get burned. I feel like it's a nice, you know, uh, get your toe wet type of thing for the patients. And then once they start to feel better, it's easier for them to want to try more. And then what's the, how would the um, dehydrated fascia relate to fibroids? To fibroids like uterine fibroids? Uh, yes. Um, so this is where my biochemical <laughs> brain is gonna go to fibroids as response to increase like estrogen and histamines. But it's interesting, Meredith, because I just was learning that histamines, high histamines, actually are a way for your body to try to help hydrate itself. And so what I've noticed, especially in kids that have food allergies, is their fingers are so dry and like dehydrated. And they have really insane histamine reactions, right? That's what the allergy cascade is. A piece of the allergy cascade. And so is it a way that the body is trying to, because high, high histamines drive high estrogens and vice versa. And the liver is supposed to process those estrogens. Um, and cortisol is supposed to help you process uh, histamines. 
So I feel like on a quantum scale, one, um, if you aren't getting good switching back between your pituitary and pineal gland, and you don't have good cortisol to help manage those histamines, this might be a, a way where you're driving estrogens high and causing the uterus for whatever reason to create these fibroids, whether it's trying to rehydrate itself. Um, in our Vigo therapy, they talk about the biggest thing with women is a malpositioned uterus. And so if the uterus is not in a good place, there's going to be fascial adhesions forming as well, which we talked about can be dehydrating because that water is not going to structure as efficiently as it could. And so is that a way for the uterus potentially to try to rehydrate itself? Um, on the other side too, is the liver is, a I feel like is really a quantum organ. A lot of its detoxing capacity is done through electrons and it needs a high redox potential to be able to do its stuff. So if you're using all of these feminine products or home care products that have endocrine disruptors and your liver isn't able to process that because it doesn't have a good redox potential and you're having high estrogens, that's, that's been a link of high estrogens and, and fibroids. But I'm always surprised when people peel back, like with histamines, as a way for the body to hydrate itself, when you really start peeling back well and keep asking why, 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 it really usually comes back to the water, right? Yeah. So, um, and that's not so interesting about the histamine because when people start to get allergies, what do they tend to do? Stay inside mm -hmm. because they want to be away from what they perceive to be the stimulants and the pollen and all of the stuff. Yeah. And so then the more time we spend inside under dehydrating light, the worse our, our allergies are going to get. Is what I hear you saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I'm not positive on the fibroids, but like, if you work it out like that, yeah. to me, a lot of things come back to dehydration and not enough of that structured water. And then when you start to repair that mitochondrial function to create that good water, it seems like a lot of things start to take care of itself. Yes, yeah. And that's the other beautiful thing about this, right? It's like, <laughs> there's no side effect or downside of trying yes. this stuff. It's yes. not like, oh, well, if I'm wrong, you, you're gonna have to deal with this. It's like, it's gonna just help. Yeah. Everyone. And it's relatively inexpensive, like to yeah. the side of free, like yes. there are a lot of really cool biohacking tools that you can buy, but you don't have to. I mean, I feel like the source, the, the light is the greatest source. Yeah, absolutely. Or sun, sun is the greatest source. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have, um, some QVC members on live. And if any of you have some questions that you'd like to ask Lauren before we wrap up, this has been a very, very deep and interesting conversation, Lord, I love it so much. Um, so just pop them in the chat or if you'd like to come on, please do that as well. So Lauren, do you wanna just give a little overview of what um, cranial sacral therapy is? Oh yeah, so the idea is, um, in our brain, we have sinuses that have uh, cerebral spinal fluid in them and they fill and empty at a certain rhythm. And so you need good quality hydration to have good quality cerebral spinal fluid. And that rhythm kind of creates this uh, expansion and contraction in the cranium. And then that rhythm is transmitted along the fascia and so you can feel that rhythm anywhere in the body. And if you feel disruption in that rhythm, then that's a hint to you that there's an area of the body that has disrupted fascia and can go ahead and treat. And the treatment for cranial sacral therapy is amazing because it's so light touch. A lot of people at first are like, is something really happening? But the more people get in tune with their body and go into their body as they feel safer to do that, they can feel the releases and you'll be treating here and they'll feel something shifting in their cranium because the fascia is a whole network. It's, you know, the 
that the site of pain of is not is happening. Yeah. Well that, and yeah, yeah. And the site of pain is not always the site of dysfunction. And that's what makes, you know, sometimes taking care of a patient, um, more challenging because especially if we've had layers of trauma, there's a whole unwinding that needs to happen to support that good flow of energy and information. So it's the light touch to help facilitate that fascial release so that you, you can help that rhythm be transmitted throughout the body. Um, in align with that, the whole mechanotransduction, you know, breathing is almost our own internal cranial sacral treatment. So good diaphragm, respiratory diaphragm function can really help support that rhythm and good mechanotransduction signals so that your body feels safe. And, you know, the vagus nerve, that's the big junction point is the diaphragm. <clears throat> so okay. it all Say makes sense. More about that. <laughs> um, so there's two sides. Uh, they've recently discovered that the, the vagus nerve is split into two uh, parts, uh, ventral vagus and your dorsal vagus. And your one side is your more parasympathetic, but in a capacity where you're social, like you feel safe, you are communicative. That's your ventral vagus. And that side is really um, from diaphragm up. So like you're able to listen to someone in a conversation. You're able to give a good uh, facial, you know, you can be like happy, like, hey, all is good. Or like, you know, they can get facial cues from you. You can speak to them. So this is what, as as humans, this is the complexity of the nervous system that we've developed to help us be the creatures that we are. And then the dorsal vagus is actually your reptilian vagus, and that's your freeze. So if you're feeling really unsafe and you just shut down, and that's from your diaphragm down. And so the diaphragm is the junction box between the ventral vagus and, and the dorsal vagus. So I feel like good diaphragm function is really helpful in supporting those senses of safety, but also from a mechanical standpoint, good diaphragm function is going to almost, like I said, give you that cranial sac self cranial sacral treatment and help facilitate good fascial flow throughout the body. If you look at the, there's a lines right throughout the body. Um, of fascia and one connects from your tongue all the way down all across the uh, diaphragm all the way down your leg and into your big toe like it's huge fascial concentration in your diaphragm and if you get good movement you're gonna facilitate good flow from you know your tongue to your big toe wow so now we're now I'm thinking why breath work is so highly recommended and why our breathing while we're doing yoga or Pilates or other exercises is so important. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's, I mean, just, I just am so always amazed as when I peel it yes. back, how it all comes back. Like it, biophysics and circadian biology just explains everything like at its core, it all is all connected <laughs> via like this lens. I feel like all the things I love. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's such a cool, it's such a cool way to look at the world. Um, I feel so lucky that we're around when all these like brilliant people started putting this together. We can learn from them. Yeah. Um, all right. So I did all the questions in the chat. Um, then there's one last question and we'll just circle back. Um, this would be a good one to end on because this is something that is so common to so many people, which is, and you mentioned it earlier, headaches. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just, just a quick review of why, um, all of these practices are so supportive of dealing with that. Sure. Annoying I think, aspect of life that so many of us have. Yeah. Well, I think the hydration aspect is key. So mitochondria are, like I said, the brain is a huge, um, hugely mitochondrial dense, uh, organ. And so supporting mitochondrial function is going to support the proper function of that brain. And I think hydration is a 
a key factor in that. From a structural standpoint, especially the upper cervical work that I do is when we have a misalignment between our head and neck, it's going to affect the drainage of fluids from our brain out. And if we have altered fluid flow, like we talked about, if we have stagnation, it's going to create a level of toxicity in the brain that is going to lead to pain and dysfunction. So you need good hydration because you you need good mitochondrial function and that is going to lead to good hydration because you want good fluid flow but you also need to make sure the structural integrity of that junction between the head and the neck is open to supporting that flow so i feel like for me the two two big things are proper hydration and proper biomechanics of that upper cervical spine to support headaches from a truly supporting the structure in all capacities. <laughs> that makes sense. Totally. That makes great sense. Lauren, thank you so much. This has just been fantastic. Um, I've learned so much and I've, I'm seeing things from different angles. Like I talk to people about this every week, multiple times a week and every time I'm like, oh, you know, it, it's just an amazing, um, and uh, yeah, you're, ability to articulate and explain what you've learned is really, really great. Thank you. So thank you. Could you let people know how to find you? I know you do, you do in-person work locally and then are you available online or just let us know? Yeah. So I am in Fairhope, Alabama, um, which we didn't even from a quantum perspective. Now I know all this stuff. I'm like, this was the perfect place to move for us. So, um, Fairhope, Alabama, the name of my clinic is South Alabama Quantum Health. Um, that's where people can see me um, locally and in person. And I do do some coaching virtually as well. That's always an option. Um, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to do structure necessarily. Although, you know, with intention, there are people that do do cranial sacral from a distance just from the intentional work. So that has a capacity to be really helpful. Um, I'm not as skilled in that as of yet. I feel like I need to work on that level skill set. Wow. But um, from as far as like the quantum coaching and like I said, preconception prep, someone who's really looking to get their body in the best state that they can to help facilitate an easy conception, a easier pregnancy, but I feel like most importantly, an easier postpartum because pregnancy is super challenging. And so if you can build yourself up enough, you're going to be able to heal better postpartum while you're caring for a newborn. It's, it's an intense time. Yes, so yes. yeah. Oh, on, that's so true. And there's so many health crises that happen for the mamas in that time. I certainly had that. Number. Yeah. Yeah. Different ones for each baby. But yeah, so I wish I'd known at the time. So, yeah. so important. So yes, I just want to echo with what you're saying here. If you are in that phase of life where you're thinking about becoming a mother or you recently have, please, please, please um, get into this stuff or reach out to Lauren. It's just real, really could like sort of change your experience in motherhood, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Carrie and Sarah have a whole quantum for a fertility course too. So like, there's so many great options to like get good information. Cause unfortunately it's hard to sometimes find. So, yes. <laughs> so yeah. That, and there's I, so much noise out there. Um, it's hard to know what to do. It's like, take this vitamin, do this, do that. But yeah, this is, yeah, like the holistic foundation to help you've just explained. So thank you, Lauren. I'm and I'm so glad you found your perfect place to live or yes. your ideal place to live. Us too. That's really it's lovely to hear. <laughs> but thank you so much, Meredith. I, I love this stuff. I love talking about it. So I'm very grateful and appreciative that you felt like it was a good thing to hear from me. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, it definitely was. And the chat is filled with people thanking you for doing this. So, and we'll do it again. We'll have to have you back and go down some more rabbit holes. Thank you. Lauren. Awesome. Thank you. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, 
visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.